Welcome to their Suffin About Suffolk, a podcast where we deep dive into the county of Suffolk. Here in episode three, we're starting our Suffolk historical timeline with the Anglo-Saxons. To tell us more is the heritage manager at Colchester and Ipswich Museums, Philip Wise. Well, the Anglo-Saxons were a, a sort of collection of peoples who lived in northern Germany and the southern part of Denmark in the early centuries after the birth of Christ. Uh, the Anglo-Saxons is a name that we give them. It wasn't necessarily what they called themselves. And, and the, these peoples were living on the very edge of the Roman Empire. And they interacted with the Roman Empire, uh, particularly through trade, uh, but also they were looking to occupy the lands which had once formed part of the the Roman Empire. So they they were sort of like the outsiders who wanted to get in to the empire or or, or indeed take over territories that had formerly been part of the empire. So around about 400, these peoples began to settle in what is now England and particularly in what is now the east of England. There's much we don't know about this this time uh, and I think it's always important to be honest and upfront about that. Uh, we're reliant on a very small number of historical sources, um, many of them written after the event and with all sorts of biases. And of course the other main source of evidence is archaeological um, and excavations have been happening in Ipswich and Suffolk for many decades now which have gradually improved our knowledge of the Anglo-Saxons. Suffolk is really one of the most significant areas in England for the study of Anglo-Saxons and, and that is basically because of its geographical proximity and closeness to the continent. So Suffolk along with Kent are, are the areas which get the earliest influx of Anglo-Saxons. They're the places where we see the sort of earliest evidence of continental influence. So the importance of Ipswich, I mean, there isn't anywhere else really quite like it at the start of the Anglo-Saxon period. It, it really is the sort of powerhouse of Anglo-Saxon England, uh, or at least part of Anglo-Saxon England. I mean, the only other, the only other areas which are comparable um, are, are York, which occupies a similar position in the Kingdom of Northumbria, which is basically the sort of north of England, um, to Ipswich, or uh, in the case of the West Saxon Kingdom, um, which is sort of the west of England, then their port is at what is now um, Southampton. It originally, it was called Hamwy. So, so there are there are other places, but um, there are only two of them. I mean, even London, London doesn't really get going until a bit later than Ipswich um, as an Anglo-Saxon port. So Ipswich and, and Suffolk really are extremely significant if you want to study the development of Anglo-Saxon England. So as Philip mentioned, this is the place to be for that sort of thing. Suffolk has several sites and discoveries of importance, all ranging from the 5th century to the 9th century. Most famously, we have the Royal Burial Site at Sutton Hoo in Woodbridge. Ten minutes up the road, a hoard was discovered at Rendlesham in 2016. Beginning its excavations accidentally in 1849, the village of West Stowe is situated near Bury St Edmunds. The Snape Cemetery near Alborough had the first ship burial discovered in England. The cemetery at Lake and Heath, famous for its man and horse burial. And three sites in Ipswich, including the Hadley Road Cemetery, the Buttermarket Kiln and the Boss Hall Brooch. 
The Anglo-Saxon period is vast, spanning from the end of Roman-occupied Britain in 400 AD, the 4th century, all the way up to the Norman conquest of 1066 AD, the 11th century. That's basically seven centuries, 700 years. So a lot did change over that course of time. And one of the things that changes is to do with religion. So when the Anglo-Saxons first arrived during the 400s AD, they are pagan. Um, they, they, they haven't really encountered Christianity. They have their own gods that they brought with them from, from Germany and the continent. And they bury their dead either as, as bodies or indeed as cremations. Um, using practices that their ancestors used. And one of the key things about this is that they buried the dead with what we call grave goods. These are, in the case of skeletons that we identify as male, they're weapons, so they're generally a spear, a knife, sometimes a shield, very, very occasionally a sword. And for those graves that we identify as female, then they're buried with their jewellery. So you can tell quite a lot about the community from what's being buried with the dead. It gives you some idea of um, how they connect with other communities. It tells you something a, a little bit sometimes about when the grave was, when the person was buried in the grave. So there's a, there's a lot of information that pagan burials give us which Christians don't. Christians didn't bury their dead with grave goods. So, so you lose all that evidence. So the Middle Saxon periods from around 650 to 850 AD are a little more difficult to understand. Sutton Hoo is interestingly on the cusp of the change in religion, which we know due to its archaeological evidence and grave goods. Here's Laura Howarth, Archaeology and Engagement Manager at Sutton Hoo, to tell us more about the grave goods found in the Great Ship Burial. Christianity is coming from both the East and West into kind of Anglo-Saxon England, and it's kind of becoming more popular in certain areas than others. So it kind of uh, is coming through Kent uh, as an example, and it's kind of establishing itself. Now, in East Anglia, we don't know so, but Radwell is a potential contender for the man buried in mound one and B tells us he had a bit of a dabbling with Christianity so and he actually constructed a kind of temple with two altars to kind of hedge his bets we think <laughs> between the the pagan world and the Christian world so if one didn't work Amazing. out he could um, say oh but remember I've still got that it's so I'm covered <laughs> Um, and people have said there's arguably kind of Christian influences in the burial. So it's a, it is a pagan Anglo-Saxon ship burial, but it's got kind of arguably, so there are some baptismal spoons and some bowls in there that have got a cross symbol on them. Now a cross doesn't necessarily say Christian, but people have thought potentially it's kind of this kind of hedging of bets, so mm -hmm. to speak. What they saw about the kind of the afterlife, it's really quite hard to say, but I think in a lot of the time in these burials, we see the kind of the grave goods reflecting their status in this world and things that they believed that they would possibly need in the next world. So, you know, even um, somebody of kind of much lower status, you know, you would kind of be buried with the things that you would use on a day to day basis. I mean, thinking about the mound one ship burial, I mean, the, um, the ships so is a 27 meter long ship. It has evidence of double riveting. So it's been patched for repair. So we know it had a life on the water. It wasn't just built for the funeral. But to effectively kind of decommission that from the water and bury that, I mean, it's quite hard to put it into modern day kind of context, but is it kind of like burying, I don't know, a plane? Your car, yeah. A, car, a really fancy sports car, a yeah. plane, that kind of thing. But these were things, you know, that kind of, I think every object was placed there for a reason, whether it had a practical, there are practical reasons. So, you know, even in the mound on ship burial, there's, you know, cauldrons and kind of feasting equipment, quite fancy stuff still, but, um, you know, the practical stuff. But there's also these kind of really high status objects as well. And they've thought about everything. I mean, there's gaming pieces, you know, a lyre for entertainment, several pairs of shoes as well. You know, there's, yeah, there's kind of everything that you would need. So I think it's quite hard in a way to think about exactly what they were thinking. But 
some sort of journey, I think, is the kind of the yeah. feeling we get. And to talk about the pagan religion that the Anglo-Saxons brought across with them is Tim from Ipswich Museum. So Laura's spoken about the man buried in Mound 1 as having two shrines, one pagan and one Christian, in a way to sort of hedge his bets. Like the guy in the 1999 film The Mummy, who carries several necklaces of different religions. That, that is kind of quite a good analogy because, I mean, the most common and popular theory is that it was uh, King Radwald. And it is kind of known that he did kind of, I mean, a lot of the, a lot of kings back then did in that kind of late 6th century, early 7th century onwards, flip back and forth between like, oh, this new religion, is it is it OK? Yeah, well, I don't know. I mean, the fact that he was buried in this massive pagan burial mound in a boat says that he hadn't, whoever it was, he hadn't completely wholesale gone with Christianity at this point. And that there are sort of quite funny examples of, you know, like missionaries coming and saying, hey, if you if you sign up to this this great new religion, you know, God will help you win all of your battles. And so the, the people are like, well, wicked, you know, let's, yeah. let's do this. Sounds and good. then they lose a battle and go, well, hey, yeah. That didn't work. The, <laughs> no, go back to the old gods. Again, we, unlike, I mean, we, we, we're lucky in a way, because if you look at the, the Norse uh, writings and so on, even though they were done a lot later, you know, very much into sort of the Christian conversion period, uh, they were a bit different to us in that in, in England and Britain, we were very much like, oh, no, bad, don't talk about it. That was awful. They were bad. We, we, we want to forget about that. Let's just move on. But in the kind of Norse uh, sagas and things like the Poetic Edda and so on, they, they saw it more as an interesting part of their culture to be preserved. And so that is where we get a lot of this knowledge of the religion of that time mm -hmm. from, because you've got to remember that, you know, what, what they're writing about in the Norse sagas and, you know, the Poetic Edda and so on, a lot of those people who believe those things would have been, you know, because they're so close to Denmark and, and Germany, a lot of that would have filtered in to Britain when the Anglo-Saxons, uh, the different tribes moved across. And there is proof of this because, you know, everybody now, thanks to Marvel, knows who Thor is yeah. and so on, um, who is traditionally seen as being a, a Norse god. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, and, you know, and his hammer and everything, and you see these sort of Mjolnir pendants and so on. But if you... If you look um, sort of close enough, you can see that there, there was equivalent, um, near identical uh, religion going on in pagan Britain. You know, there's a sixth mm. century find, I think, from Kent of a Thor's hammer, which is a long time before you got like Viking raids and so on. Mm -hmm. And and even things like the Sutton Who helmets, there are kind of nods to possibly Odin in that the eyebrows, the shiny red eyebrows it has, one of them has gold foil behind it and one of them doesn't. So one of them kind of shines and the other one's kind of dead. And that could be a kind of reference to Odin only having one eye. And so it is, it, you know, the, the clues are there that we, we had a very similar belief system. Uh, I mean, even the days of the week are the the Anglo-Saxon equivalent names for the Norse gods. So instead of Thor, you had Thunor, which is Thunor's day, Thursday. Odin was Woden. And so you've got Woden's day for Wednesday. Tu was a, a god of war, you've got Tuesday, and, and so on and so on. So there is there is certainly enough evidence to kind of say, yeah, we basic, basically believe the same thing. Mm -hmm. But whether it would be 100% exactly what the Norse belief system was mm -hmm. we we sadly just don't know you know yeah i would say probably there would be differences in yeah. the same way as you've got this this you know these stories moving down from the north down into kind of germany and then across to here almost like a game of chinese whispers it's bound to change a little bit and mm -hmm. and take on a slightly more unique flavor but what what that flavor was will we'll probably never know exactly, sadly. Whilst their early beliefs may not have lasted, as we've seen, the Anglo-Saxons brought with them something else that did. Language. I caught up with Charlie Haylock again, this time to discuss the origins of the English language and how it all stemmed from those early settlers. The birth 
of the English started in the 5th century. Now during the 5th century Britain as it was known then, not England at all, hadn't come into existence then, Britain was occupied by the Romans and in the 5th century due to the problems back in Rome they left leaving behind the Britons speaking a language that is very similar to Welsh and Cornish today, Brythonic. There are a few place names and river names in Suffolk that still have those Brythonic names. Um, Clare, the River Stour. Right, so there's a few Brythonic names left. Now the English arrived and these were four tribes. You had mainly the Angles and the first Angles to settle, they created a kingdom called the East Angles. Now the Angles came from Jutland, from a place called Angolan. And the reason why it was called Anglin is because there was a peninsula shaped like a fish hook. And their name for a fish hook was Angle. And that's why when you go fishing you're going angling because you've got an angle on the end rather than a hook. Right? So the East Angles were then formed. Now the first place they settled um, was Ipswich, as we know. And they called it Ipswich. They then went up the River Deben, which is Anglo-Saxon for Deep One, and then they set up camp at Coison, um, which translates as Kingstown, which is now part of Woodbridge, and also at Rendlesham. When the kings died, they went across the River Deben and buried them at Sutton Hoo, which is Anglo-Saxon South Tuna Hall, which means South Farm on the hillside, on the slope. Right. The East Angles is present day Suffolk, Norfolk and Cambridgeshire. Those south of the River Waveney and the River Little Ouse were known as the South Folk and north of the River Waveney and north of the Little Ouse was known as the North Folk. The North Folk, the Norfolk. So that's how we get Suffolk and Norfolk. The Saxons came in and they left their homeland, which was Schleswig Holstein, present day Schleswig Holstein. The vast majority of Saxons, so called because they had a short sword, fighting sword called a Siax, so they were known as the Siaxons. Right. The Saxons went south from Schleswig Holstein, took over a big area, and that area was named after them Saxony. They came over here as well, and the area that they took over was also named after them. The East Saxons, the Middle Saxons, the West Saxons and the South Saxons, which eventually became known as the Essex, the Middlesex, the West Sax and the Sudsex, which is present day Essex, Sussex, Middlesex and of course Wessex. The Jutes came from Jutland and they settled in present day Kent, well half of Kent, along the south coast, Isle of Wight and half of present day Hampshire. The Frisians came from North Netherlands and the Frisian Islands and they came in mainly with the East Angles and the Jutes and we have place names in Suffolk the East Angles um, that are representing the Frisians. Friston, Freston and we even have a Frisian Fjelda which is Freshenfield so that's where the Frisians settled. Right. They all spoke the same language but a different dialect and after the East Angles, then more Angles arrived, and then we had the Middle Angles, which was from the East Angles to the present day Welsh border. North of those two, we then had Mercia and Lindsay, present day Lincolnshire. And then north of that, we had Northumbria, going all the way up to Edinburgh. Edinburgh was part of the Angle Territory Kingdom, Northumbria. They started to fight one another, and the Middle Angles were taken over by Mercia and Lindsay swapped hands between Northumbria and Mercia. East Angles were also taken over by Mercia and then back again. So there's lots of fighting going on. Right. Now, but they all spoke the same language. Angles, Jutes, Frisian, but they were known later on as the English because the Angles were the biggest invading force by far, going from Sudbury on the 
East Saxon Essex border, Suffolk right the way up to Edinburgh. And eventually that became the Anglo part of Anglo-Saxon, but that word hasn't come into existence yet, right? The Britons were overrun and they became strangers in their own country. And the old English word for stranger is Walish. So lots and lots of Britons were pushed over to the west and that big area on the side of England became known as Walish, present day Wales. The ancient kingdom of Kern became known as Kern Walish, Cornwallis, Cornwall. Lots of Britons thought, blow this and we're going to emigrate and they went to northern France and the area that they took over eventually became known as Brittany. That's how Brittany gets its name. Originally it was Britannia uh, by the Normans and we were Britannia and then in the 1200s Geoffrey de Monmouth thought we've got to distinguish between these two so he kept Britannia as Britannia and the other Britannia became Grand Britannia. Great Britain. That's how we get Great Britain. And anyway. So early Old English, the language is now forming. The English language is now forming. And early Old English would be gestern day, ich deid ver, the vase good. Today, ich storm up aris mit Regen and Hegelsha, wie hidden under them Hegwagen. Now you're going to be under, you're going to understand that later on. Okay. I can assure you that. <laughs> I really do. Right, so that is early Old English. And we've got. The Wuffingers were the ruling classes of the East Angles. Now, the Wuffingers means the wolf tribe, or the followers of a leader called Wolf. Now, Wolf was a nickname given to a, a warrior, a prestigious warrior. Um, wolf, Wolfguard became Woolard. Wolfhelm wore a helmet with a wolf on that went into battle. He led the troops. He became known Wilhelm and eventually William. So lots and lots of names with wolf in it. And so these were the lead. Now they were an offshoot from the Swedish royal family. And they settled in Angolan and then became the kings of the East Angles. Um, got lots of English place names due to the, the Angle invasion. We're here at Edwardston, Edwardston, down the road as Boxford. And there's a lovely place just down the road on the way to Berry called Alfeton. And that means the estate of the royal beauty. Um, ton being farmland or an estate, and Alfit means noble beauty. And one of the very few places that was owned by a female. Um, all the Stokes, meaning a little hamlet outside the main village. Toy, which is peculiar to Suffolk, that was common ground for grazing for people that were passing through. The Lee, meaning sort of a meadow. So lots and lots of Anglo-Saxon or Old English words in our place names. In Woodbridge, it was called Kingston or Kyson. It was Old English, Kennington, meaning the King's Estate or Royal Manor, right? And also you've got Kyson Hill and Kyson Point, which is abbreviated forms of Kingston Hill and Kingston Point. And you've also got Kyson Hoo, so in Woodbridge. So you can see there's lots and lots of... And also we've got lots of Old English words in the Suffolk dialect. Boar. Here you go and boar. Well, it depends on what part of Suffolk you come from. This part of Suffolk, uh, it's mine here you go, but. When you get Barry Sedmans, it's mine here you go, ba. Stone Market, Needham, it's mine here you go, ba. And when you get East Suffolk, it's ba. And in Norfolk, it becomes ba. And that's pure Anglo-Saxon for somebody who tills the soil. A peasant farmer. I'm a small holding farmer. And also in Suffolk, we don't say nearly. We say it's nigh on 11 o'clock. Um, there's nigh on 15 of them. Right, the end is nigh, and grandmother used to say nine or boy for near boy. So if you have a small holding farmer or somebody who tills the soil who lives next door to you, he becomes your neighbor, which is the English word for neighbor. And some people also think that boar is also a shortened version of neighbor. That lanya, 
Now, Laan is pure Anglo-Saxon. Laren, the German word today is Lehren, and it means to teach. So therefore, when we say that Laan, yeah, we're saying that will teach you and not that will learn you. On the H, H is an Anglo-Saxon word, H-O-H, -H, H, meaning on the slant. And also, where you see places like Colfo, um, Dallinghu, Suttonhu, comes from the word hall on a slanting hill slope. Airy wiggle is the Suffolk word for an earwig, and that's where the English get the word earwig from, airy wiggle. Polly wiggle is a tadpole, poll meaning head, and wiggle, so it's a head with a wiggle. <laughs> a lovely description of a tadpole. So you can see there's words in there. And also, our pronunciation, the Suffolk pronunciation, especially the double syllable, is going back to Anglo-Saxon times. It's the Ang pronunciations. So, S-T-E-O-R, steel, is the English word today, steer, right? Well, we say steer, goes back. Tagel, with a G, but the G was also pronounced as a Y sound, which I'm going to go into later, and it becomes tail. So tagel becomes tail, and it's what the dog wags when it's pleased to see you, tail. You can see the Suffolk dialect coming in there. R-E-G-N, Reagan. The Germans pronounce it as Reagan today, but change the G to a Y, and you get Reagan. And we've had plenty of that lately. <laughs> yeah, Reagan. So you can hear that Suffolk double syllable coming in there. We then had the Vikings arrive in the 8th century. Now, this, they had a massive effect on the English language, and it's only now really being recognised by scholars. Um, the Vikings helped to streamline the English language to what it is today. They really did. Now, in early Anglo-Saxon, or Old English, we must call it Old English, really, because Old English also includes Old Norse. Anglo-Saxon doesn't recognise the Viking element. So, in early Old English, you had male nouns, female nouns, neutral, and you had strong nouns, and you had weak nouns. Now, all the adjectives that went with them all had to be spelt different, dependent on whether it was a strong vowel, a strong noun, a weak noun, neutral, female, or male. Now, the Danes, Right, the Vikings, when they arrived, they spoke the same language as the Anglo-Saxons, Jutes and Frisians, but a different dialect. And so they went to no interpreters yet until when the Normans arrived. So they take the language down to the lowest common denominator so they can understand one another. So we ended up with the, and everything was, so you had female table, male chairs, female house, female boat, male this, male that, strong name, this, strong that. Because of the Danes, we had the. And we just kept the noun exactly the same spelling and didn't have to change it. And when I give my talks in the schools, the kids all say, thank you, Danes. <laughs> Absolutely right. Also, the way of um, plurals, right? You could add, dependent on whether it's a strong noun, weak noun, neutral, male or female, you can add an ES on the end, S, A, U, E, N, N, Lots and lots of ways of making a plural. But, because of the Danes, we mainly added ES and S on the end and made it simpler. Right, this is a leftover, right, with today's plurals. And you can see that we've still got leftovers of the Danish and Old English and Anglo-Saxon mix, we really have. We'll begin with the box and the plural as boxes but the plural of ox becomes oxen, not oxes. One fowl is a goose and two are called geese, yet the plural of moose should never be meese. You may find a mouse in a nest full of mice, yet the plural of house is houses, not hoise. If the plural of man is always called men, why shouldn't the plural of pan be pen? If I spoke of my foot and I show you my feet, if I give you a boot, a pair should be beat. If one is a tooth and the whole set of teeth, why isn't the plural of booth be beef? Then one would be that and three would be those, yet hat in the plural would never be hose, and plural of cat would never be coes. We speak of a brother and also of brethren, but though we say mother, we never say metherin. So plurals in English, I think you'll agree, are indeed very tricky, singularly. <laughs> so this mix 
then took place. Now, two letters we've got to look at. The letter G and the letter V. Now, the Swedes, right, they pronounce the letter G as both G and Y. If you ask a Swede today to pronounce Gothenburg, they'll pronounce it as Jötebri. A place in northern Denmark, Jutland, it's a place S-K-A-G-E-N, Skagen, not Skagen, Skagen. And that's why we've got lots of words in the English language today with a G in being pronounced as a Y. Sign, fight, Queen's reign, number eight, 18, there's lots and lots of words with a G in being pronounced as a Y. The V, right, would be pronounced as a W. Now the W is peculiar to the English and the Welsh. You won't find a W in any other European language. They've got a double V. So in the French it's R-S-T-U-V-W-V. Not R-S-T-U-V-W-U, it's R-S-T-W-V. We are W. We put two U's together side by side and made the W. Over on the continent they put two V's side by side and made it a double V. So we've got a letter W that they haven't got and they've got a letter double V which we haven't got. What makes it a little bit difficult as we the English write down the W as a double V and call it a double U. <laughs> but that's why Arsene Wenger was in charge of Arsenal Football Club and not Arsene Wenger. And it's why the Germans will say where are you going and what are you doing because they're seeing that W as a double V. So that's when the angles came over. It was written down as Gipperswick. Right, but later the Normans saw a G and it became Gipperswick. But the angles pronounced it as Yipsage. So that's why you've got Gipperswick Park and it's also called Ipswich and a river gipping and not a river yipping. So the two have mixed in together there. Going back to these Vikings, we've got lots and lots of Old Norse words in the English language. Anger, bag, bylaw, cake, freckle, husband, omsbudman, there, them, they, ugly, wrong, all are Old Norse based words. So you can see they've had a massive influence on the English language and because Suffolk became part of the Dane law, right? Because there was a big fight between the Angles, or the, and that's when that's when the word English came in. King Alfred of Wessex, right, led some troops against the Danes. Now, the most of his troops were Angles, so he collared the phrase English also to distinguish himself from his cousins over in Europe, in Saxony. So he called it Anglish, and that's where, because that was the vast majority of his troops. And then, after a battle, he pushed the Danes back, because the Danes had got all the way down to Somerset, he pushed them back, and the Dane law, the line was drawn from the Essex side of London, zigzagged across to the River Mersey. Everything north of that was Danish controlled, everything south of that was English controlled. Well, included Suffolk, didn't it? The Dane law, right? Except North Northumbria, that stayed English, all right? And we've got place names in Suffolk with Old Norse roots. Ashby, it's farmstead settlement by the ash trees. Minsmere, pool by the mouth of the river. Ike, oak tree. Risby, farmstead settlement by the brush. All the Thorpes are Old Norse words. It means a secondary settlement to a main settlement. And then West Thorpe, Old Norse, Vesterthorpe, is a secondary settlement to the west. And then you've got Lowestoft, so you've got a Viking called Flover, and Toft means a settlement. So it's a settlement belonging to Flover, so it becomes Thlovestoft, which becomes Lowestoft. Summerladen and Summerton is Summerlithy, a farmstead settlement belonging to a summer raider. So the Tom bit is Anglo-Saxon or Old English, but summer lithy means um, the summer raider, a pirate, a Viking. And then some old Scandinavians, they owned land and they took over from existing English. So you get the Builder of Bilderston, the Carl of Carlton, the Drenger of Drinkston and the Flicker of Flixton, all Scandinavians. So you can see it's a big, big influence. And I've got a few examples of old Scandinavian words in English in the uh, Suffolk dialect. 
And these words I've taken from Suffolk dialect by A.O.D. Claxton, 1968. Dag. There was a heavy dag this morning. The dew. Dag. And the Swedish word today is dag. Ding. To throw or hurl. Dinge. To rain mistily and drizzle. Flacking. Flapping loosely like a clothesline. Right? Grup. That's an open channel carrying the water off a, a road into the ditch. Grup is the Old Norse. Hake, a hook in the fireplace. Um, Halva, for a holly tree. The Old Norse is Halfa. Lum. Um, marum, mat grass or seaweed on the shore. Old Norse, it's Marum. I know. Um, Ranny, for a shrew. Old Norse, for a long nose. Ranny, and a shrew's got a long nose. A rove, or roove, depending on what part we suffer from, is a scab that's not quite healed. That comes from Old Norwegian, rover. So, to Sarnik, to dawdle up the hill, Isarnik up the hill, comes from Sanka, which is Old Norse. Strup, for the, for the windpipe. Swedish today, it's strup. So you can see the links are there. And when the Normans arrived, they introduced the system of hereditary surnames. Now, up until that point, the English, which is now a mix of Anglo-Saxon plus Old Norse, as we've just proven, so the English had either Old Norse nicknames or Old Anglo-Saxon nicknames and by names, trade names and the like. They then adopted them as surnames. They didn't take on Norman surnames, they adopted their own nicknames as surnames because it was beneficial when they were writing their wills. And so some of the old English surnames, all the surnames ending in cock, means son of. Cock is the old Anglo-Saxon word for son of. Cock in Anglo-Saxon times referred to a male part of the anatomy, but it was an ordinary word. It only became a taboo word and a rude, vulgar word in the 1700s. So it'd be quite easy to say foot, knee, cock, chest, head, and nobody would know any different. And they wouldn't even snigger or smile because it was just an ordinary word. And they also called their sons cock. So instead of being Peterson, it was Peacock. Instead of being Adam's son, it was Adcock. You then have Alecock. Now that is a trade name. That means somebody who made beer taps, because cock meant tap, and that's why it referred to, so it makes sense, doesn't it? Yes. So when a baby was born, the first thing they looked for, because a male heir was important, was the little tap. 75% of Suffolk surnames, because I give talks on surnames, 75% of the audiences I have, have Anglo-Saxon or Old Norse um, based surnames. Today, they're still there. See? So surnames are over a thousand years old. So we can see that the English language has now formed. The structure of the English language has formed too. And before the Normans arrived, the structure of the English language is the same then as it is now. So Harold at Hastings, Henry V at Agincourt, Winston Churchill in his wartime speeches, Boris Johnson trying to get us out of Covid, all use the same structure language right what we have done since then is add words from around the world the Normans left the English language alone it was the language of the conquered it was the language of the peasant it was the language of the uneducated and they left it alone thank goodness but we the English because the sheriffs the barons the large landowners the king's aristocracy, because they were Norman, right, we took words from them and added it in to the English language. And the hundred most common words in the English language today, 93 are Anglo-Saxon, four are Old Norse, and three are Norman French. So, I'm going to go early Old English, late Old English, and what I said earlier, you'll be able to interpret. So early old English. Gestern day, they'd weather vase good. Today, storm up our rest mid Regen and Hegelshaw. We hidden under them haywagon. Now what we're gonna do 
let's change the G to a Y sound and we're going to change the V to a W sound. The only word we won't change is goad. So, gestern dag they'd weather ways good. Yestern day the weather ways good. Yesterday the weather was good. Today storm up Arras with Regen and Hegel show. Today storm up Arras arose amid a rain and hail shower. Today a storm arose amid a rain and a hail shower. We hidden under them hay wagon. We hidden under them hay wagon or we hidden under them hay wain. Now, what you can't do with all these words we've taken from around the world is string them together and make a sentence. There's 600,000 words in the Oxford English Dictionary today. We have taken words from around the world and added it in. We've taken from the Normans, roughly 10,000. We, during the Renaissance period in Elizabethan times, we took roughly 10,000 words from the Italians, which were either Latin-based, Greek-based or Arabic-based. We made up lots of words in the, in, the, in the Elizabethan period during the Renaissance. Shakespeare made over 1,500, I think it was 1,720 words he made up that are now in the English language, most of them. Right, others fell by the wayside. But I can speak to you using nothing but old English words. Well, well I'll do it now. This is all old English. I can speak to you with old English words and you will understand every word that I am saying. I'm not using any words from any other land or any other tongue and you can understand me. You can see the structure of the English language is there, can't you? The, the hundred most common words in the English language today are those structured, it's the structure. It's the words like the, of, and, a, to, that. So they are the simple words, the structure. And because that structure is so simple, it's strong. And that's why we can take words from around the world and still keep adding it into that structure. So the structure of the English language has not changed from 1065 to the present day. The pronunciations have changed, the spellings have changed, but the structure hasn't. And that's why, thank goodness, we've never ever had an official standard English. It's never, it's unofficial. And that's why Shakespeare could make up all those words, because we didn't have a structure. And yet, on the other hand, you had King James's Bible, and because that was being translated from the ancient Greek, Latin and Hebrew, that, which were structured languages, that is very structured. So on the one hand, you had James's Bible. On the other hand, you had Shakespeare making up words. Nouns became verbs, verbs became nouns, pluses make up words. Right. And so you had the two running side by side. We even do it today. And we can do this, whereas the French can't. Because of Académie Française, it's a very strict language. And in 200 years' time, there will be an ancient French and a modern French. Ancient French, as per Académie Française, which was set up in the 1600s under Cardinal Richelieu, and modern French, which people are going to speak. So we get two days at the end of the week. And so we could, oh, we'll call that a weekend. But the French can't do that, so it's a weekend. We now put a camera and we hold it and we smile and we call it a selfie. The French can't do that, so it's le selfie. And Academy France says, no, 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 you can't do that. We've got to keep it. So eventually that will split. Where you've had strict lines and straight jacketed languages, Latin, ancient Greek, and French going that way to, they die because they can't move with the times. But English, because we've never ever had that official standard, it was made up unofficially in the late 1700s, standard English and standard spelling. And that's why we can keep on moving with the times. It's a very, very rich language. And as I said before, we've got 600,000 words in the English language. That's twice as many as any other language you can't mention. Twice as many as the French and much more than any other language. So we have a rich vocabulary. We can have 10 ways of saying this, 10 ways of saying that, six ways of describing that, 15 ways of saying this. And that's why our playwrights and our authors right, are revered around the world. Chaucer, Agatha Christie, Shakespeare, they are translated all around the world. All our great authors are. The English language is so rich, there's not another language like it. It's the best language in the world, and it's the greatest gift we've ever given the world.
Next week, I'll be talking to Alan Baxter, a heritage consultant who worked at Westo for 30 years. We'll find out how Lord of the Rings ties into Anglo-Saxon Suffolk and what eventually happens to the Anglo-Saxons as their era draws to a close. You can follow Suffin About Suffolk on YouTube to hear the full-length versions of interviews and bonus material. And if you enjoy the podcast, you can head to co-fi.com forward slash Suffin About Suffolk and show your support for the price of a cup of coffee. All links are in the description. All music heard on the podcast are original recordings by The Silberies. You can follow them on Twitter at Silberies The or head to their website www.thesilberies.com.